Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to um, it's day three of week four and um, PR three. And what we're going to do today is there's a couple of things that I need to just take you through. So we've had class earlier today in terms of um, the lectures that were supposed to be held. And there's just a couple of things that I need to just um, share with you and we're going to cover today. So in terms of the connectivity, when we log on online, please try and check your connectivity wherever you are. I know we're, we're having a challenge with that in terms of connecting in, you're not able to hear me um, and things like that. So just we need to be mindful of that and have a look. So also a couple of things that I'm, I'm slightly concerned about and I think we'll cover it in this. So this is going to be your lecture for actually um, tomorrow, which I am recording today. And then we have our guest lecture to 2 p.m. tomorrow, which the link for that is on the second page of week four's roadmap. And it's uh, the CSI manager from Aspen Pharmacare that I reminded you about. So just in terms of the commitment to the process in PR3 and being successful, and I thought that it's going to be in a recorded session. So if you ever need to refer back to it, it will be great. That's what you can actually do. So the way that it works and in terms of you to get the best out of this course that you are investing your time, money and effort into is as follows. The approach is going to be a little bit, um, I'm going to set the scene in terms of what is expected and what you need to do. So every single week, between Thursday and Friday. So generally um, it's, it's, it's done by Thursday afternoon. Your roadmap for the next week will be on Cole campus. If it's not there on Thursday, by Friday, it should be up. So what you need to do is we are now in week four. Next week is going to be week five and then it's face-to-face -face classes. This week was online but I've recorded the sessions um, on Tuesday. Today, we've had our sessions live on Teams and I'm recording the session for tomorrow. So what needs to happen is those roadmaps. They basically give you an outline when you look at it very clearly. What are the outcomes we're trying to achieve for the week? And it is linked to a lesson plan which you will see if you look on, on week four, it is the learning outcomes for week four. Now, if we backtrack a little bit in terms of the introduction, and perhaps I will share my screen just so that you are able to um, see what I want to share with you. Um, Just want to do this very quickly so that you are able to share and see the, the, the screen that I am trying to get to very quickly. Sometimes it, it works and it doesn't work, but here we go. Got it. Right. If you look on the screen and it says Public Relations 3 Roadmap, Week 4, PR Class of 2023. So a key word, I'm going to read what the introduction says. A key word in PR is strategy. As we start with Chapter 3, we begin to look at prescriptive and descriptive strategy and the role of social change. This chapter outlines an overview of social change as an emergent force and its role in strategy formulation. It also highlights the emergent nature of strategy and its response to wrongful or unethical social societal problems. Now, the reason why we give you the roadmap is for you to have a proactive 
proactive approach, which is one of the skills that you need to build as a public relations practitioner, is that you will see we outline it in detail for you. So when it refers to chapter three, it means that you need to go through and you need to read chapter three in detail to be able to understand what it says, what is, is communicated in that chapter, and then link it to the outcomes that is attached to week four. So in terms of the lessons, we have lesson 19, right? We have 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Okay, so if, for example, the, the feedback on activity page 55, which we discussed in week three, we did cover it. Now, there is a challenge in terms of, and you'll see we, we include a lot of the links, but we do cover that in class as well. Now, what is very important that you need to note is that in lesson 19, we mentioned students will fill in a peer rubric so that feedback can be discussed and applied to FA1. I need to emphasize this in terms of we've done this exercise last week in class where the peer rubric was explained in terms of how to use it. And when Mbali presented Nipo, you did a peer review in terms of that document that I gave you and vice versa. So Mbali, you, when you presented Nipo also did um, the peer review on you. So you, you conducted that and then you gave feedback and then I gave you feedback in terms of what it needs to, to, to be understood for that. Now, in terms of the peer rubric, we still need to get to a point where we are going to actually have a thorough understanding of how to do the rubric because it is a bit a bit challenging we didn't manage to get it right unfortunately um which for me was a little bit sad for today's lesson also i need to make it very clear and this is to emphasize it because I don't think it is hitting home loud enough for everyone, is that when exercises like, for example, in last in yesterday's lecture, I, I mentioned to you that you need to do specific homework and have it sent through to me. And it was, um, there was a peer rubric that needed to be done. This is the one that's on the screen currently. So this wasn't done and we lost a lot of time in class today because of the fact that it wasn't done and it was not done properly. So it was mentioned that for your FA1 that you are doing objectives the way I had taught it in depth last week. You've done it and you're applying it to your formative assessment one why are you not doing it for the activities that are being given to you and homework in class that you're not doing it accordingly? For me, I fail to understand. I'm going to repeat what I, I mentioned in class today, and I think it's very important to, to emphasize this. And also, this is a recorded session, as I've mentioned. You can go back and listen to, to actually to, to what I've mentioned if you need to be reminded in terms of, of, of what needs to be discussed. So here's the thing, is that the activities that are given to you in class in terms of being able to navigate through it, and everything that's given to you in class is actually, in actual fact, it's prepping you for your FA1. So you need to take these exercises seriously. There's sometimes you may, as you mentioned to me today, is that you may drop the ball. I'm perfectly fine. And there are instances where you're going to have challenges, which we will work around and which we have always done so. So very important for you to understand is the exercises, the homework that you are given to do out of class, um, based on what was presented today, 
it was not done well. I need to emphasize that it was done really not well. There was some effort put in, but some of it I felt was just done for the sake of it, the way it, it needed to be done. Furthermore, when I checked today, chapter three up to today's class, um, hadn't you hadn't read it. There were instructions in homework that I gave in, in last week, yesterday's recording for yesterday's class that was not done for today. It is disappointing. So please take note of this, is that all of these activities, exercises, and your discipline and commitment to get it done is going to be a reflection of what is going to be the outcome in your formative assessment one. We are now in week four and objectives have been covered in detail yesterday, not yesterday, last week. We, and this is something, if you go back to my recording yesterday, I've mentioned it. On a whiteboard, I explained to you extensively, you did mention the challenge that you had to swap lectures and the one lecture taught you that you use in-text referencing, the other one didn't, and you, you confused. We are clearing up the confusion as we're going along. So you shouldn't have an, a problem with doing objectives because last week in class, we covered it quite extensively, how to write an, an objective correctly. So that is something that I'm going to tick off as we have done. Secondly, the, the, the concern around in-text referencing needs to be gone. Because also in last week's class, what I did was I took you through the understanding, because you've mentioned that one of your previous lectures said in-text referencing is not relevant. You just need a Harvard, um, a list of references at the end. I've corrected that. So there should be no issues with no in-text references. Now, in terms of the documents that you produced for the um, social issue, right? You did a presentation on that. And secondly, for the Anhauser, if you look at the statements that were made, there are no in-text, not all of it, some of it, it does not have in-text referencing. So in terms of objectives and in-text referencing, we have covered that. So I expect it to be 100%. If you're concerned that I am being very stringent on quality, right? And in terms of spelling, grammar, this is, you are in public relations three. You should be on an expert level in terms of that. I've had a request to take you through to the PRESA seven step plan because you felt in your summative that you put in a lot of effort. However, um, you felt that in, in, in terms of what you were taught, it was not aligned in terms of, of, of the seven step plan. I'm happy to help you and we will cover that next week. Um, in terms of um, trying to help you navigate through the challenges so that you don't make the same mistakes. The other thing that we, we, we chatted about today was in terms of the theory and the application, not connecting. Now, I have to reiterate this, and I've mentioned it many times, is that when you are doing a plan, a seven-step plan, a campaign, anything that needs research where you're doing a situational analysis, messages, objectives, every single thing has got to be a story and it's got to have a golden thread throughout it. Okay. So I think very important is to critique and also do a little bit of self introspection. I know that it may be challenging for you on, on, on a third year in terms of you feel. So by now, in terms of PR, you have the PR1 foundation, you have the PR2 foundation. So in terms of PR3, the only thing that's going to change is the level of the strategy. Nothing else changes. You have the foundation from PR1 and PR2. Okay. So in terms of researching where you say you still don't understand how to write messages, 
Um, I did mention that apart from the textbook, and if you refer to your handbook of public relations, it's the one with the bees on it, the beehive and the bees. If you look at the seven step plan, look at what it, it, it gives or, or the outline of what messaging is about. And then you need to go through and do additional research. Remember, one of the aspects that we, we cover extensively in PR2 is research. The kinds of research we do, quantitative, qualitative, all the, of those um, terms, if you're not familiar, go through and research them and read them again. So in terms of PR2, you need to go this, I think it's chapter, I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, I can't remember. Let me just grab the textbook quickly. So the Handbook of Public Relations, that is your second year textbook. Chapter eight, which is page 72. It talks about quantitative, qualitative research, et cetera. The research problem, right? The monitoring evaluation, it gives you the different kinds of um, research methodology, whether it's surveys, questionnaires, whatever the case may be, face-to-face -face interviews, all of that. Then when you look on page 76, it outlines the research process. So the research brief, right? The background, the objectives, it gives you the research proposal. It gives you objectives, research design, sampling design, method of data collection, cost and timing, special needs, resources of the firm. And then on page 80, it gives you the kind of questions. It, it talks about the research report. Now, please, do go and refer to that part of your textbook in your PR2 textbook. So remember, I did say in week one, we need you actually need to bring those textbooks with you apart from the other two, uh, well, apart from your PR3 textbook, you are going to be referring to PR2 textbook, which is the one that I've indicated. So as far as, as the way forward in terms of the challenges that you are experiencing and to do well, and I actually counted down the days for you today, actually. I, I mentioned that we have literally, um, it's 20 odd days left up until you've got to submit your FA1 um, assignment, which is I think the week of the 8th to the 16th. And also uh, very importantly is the public holidays. So you want to take a little bit of a break, but you also need to get this formative assessment one. I did indicate that um, we are going to, for your FA1, although I am going to be marking it, what is going to happen is it is moderated to make sure that the mark is fair. Um, so just ensure that you keep that in mind in terms of um, when you are preparing your FA1. It's not just going to be me that's going to be marking it. I will mark it. And then a moderator will look at it to see whether your mark is fair or not. So everything that you've done, you've done a PR plan last year. You said you were not, um, by the end of the year, you were not 100% sure because you were taught a little bit differently. There was a change of lectures and um, so forth. So what we're going to do is we have some catching up to do, and hence I am doing the recording of the session um, for tomorrow because we also have a guest speaker at two o'clock. So I've mentioned it to you, it's Thursday, 16 March, and at two o'clock, the second page of your week four roadmap will have the Teams link to connect so that you are able to join in the lecture. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm also going to be sharing um, videos as well as we go through the presentation and then you can then interrogate it. Now, let us come back to where we need to get to because we have a lot to cover just because of the delay in terms that we had because um, 
the class was not sufficiently prepared for the homework that was given to them. And that is why we had a delay. We had a delay because there was also connectivity issues. So you couldn't hear me. Um, my signal's fine and we weren't into going into load shedding. So we might go into load shedding at two o'clock. So before then I might stop this recording and, and then I may connect uh, as a hotspot and then I will start continue with the recording of this. But up until then, let's keep going. So on my screen, you should actually, let me just do this to make sure that I am sharing my screen. Um, okay, now you see me, now we are going to the document. Okay, so this is the presentation that we, we covered yesterday and um, we ended off here, I think it was here. So learning outcomes for lesson 20 to 24 to develop flexibility as a strategist to respond to any changing reality, show awareness of the environmental context characterized by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Understand the advantages of an emergent approach to strategy formulation. Distinguish between strategy that emerges as compared to a strategy that is deliberate, okay? So that is going to be the outcomes for lessons 20 up to 24, which is essentially for this week. The lecture that is going to be speaking tomorrow will cover the um, an emerging strategy, if I stand and understand to be corrected. I think that is the case. Um, yes, so she will, it's going to be on an emerging strategy, but very important for you to log in and listen in to her. Okay, so in terms of a well compiled strategy is essential when organizations want the public's behavior and attitude to change the target groups that their success depends on. Strategy is a practical tool that guides any business. It keeps the organization focused and ensures that it remains goal oriented in a context defined by change. Change means getting involved and taking action that is critical for the business. This is where strategy, impact, and vision blend. Strategy as prescriptive, which assumes a purely formalized and rational approach, or strategy as a descriptive where strategy is more informal and emergent. So you have two types of strategies and you need to understand how to differentiate between the two. It is therefore essential for practitioners and academics to consider the pattern and character of the strategy formulation process among organizations. So this chapter is basically going to outline an overview of social change as an emergent force and its role in strategy formulation. It also highlights the emergent nature of strategy and its response to wrongful or unethical societal problems. Okay, so now we are going to go, we're going to go quickly and have a look at this video in terms of how does social change happen? And this is an introduction to the chapter. So I'm going to switch screens, stop sharing. I am going to do If I'm not mistaken, we did share this video yesterday, but I am going to play it um, for you. Ah, the past. A time without video games, smartphones, anti-lock brakes, and many basic human rights we enjoy today. Things that are ordinary now used to be considered wild and crazy notions. Take voting. Not that long ago, the very thought of women at the ballot box had people in a tizzy. But after decades of fighting, the suffragists prevailed. And since then, our collective attitude towards women's rights has continued to expand. Today, 
the thought of women not having the right to vote is ludicrous. So how do we get from there to here? How does social change happen? First of all, when we talk about making social change, we're often talking about changing cultural values. These are the core principles and ideals upon which an entire community exists. They're part of everyday life and feel as natural as breathing. For example, in the United States, one of these core ideals is freedom of speech. But even something so fundamental, like what freedom of speech even means, has changed over time. Why? Well, for one thing, technology changes over time. Technology is a big factor in social change. Here's one example. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the popularization of the bicycle played an important role in the women's suffrage movement. Bikes were a new technology that gave women more than a means of transportation. The bicycle meant freedom. They wanted to use that new freedom. So the bicycle helped empower women to demand other freedoms, like being able to vote. The activist Susan B. Anthony even said, woman is riding to suffrage on the bicycle. It helped women to challenge social norms in everyday life. The women's movement had already been underway for decades, having launched nationally at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. But the 19th Amendment, which granted voting rights to women, wasn't ratified until 1920. So it took the suffragists, what, seven decades to get the vote? And when they did, then everything immediately worked out great, right? No problems. Justice. <laughs> yeah, right. So why is it so hard to change society? Social change often arises from conflict. Many people in dominant groups resist social change. The status quo represents their core beliefs or benefits them. They actively want things to stay the same. Or maybe it's just so they don't think that issue affects them. So why do anything? Either way, that pushback means social change is not smooth. Here's just one extreme example. In the 1870s, the Ku Klux Klan targeted Southern white people who had lost the Civil War and their entire economic system based on slavery. Then, the next wave of the KKK used new technology to revive their cause. Propaganda films that were designed to spread and normalize their racist values. Of course, these cultural shifts and the resulting pushback are nothing new. Dina Rollinger, professor of sociology at Florida State University, tells us more. We want to think of social change as uncomplicated but it's anything but. So one of the things that you really need is you need to have a social movement. You need to have a diverse set of groups that generally share a goal and are acting more or less together to enact some kind of change. But that alone is not enough. You have to have politicians or other kinds of elites who also think that the issue is important. You need public support. And oftentimes you need some kind of event, something that really gets people's attention and puts an issue on the radar. Movements take decades of people gathering public support and lobbying to get new laws on the books. But laws are only one piece of the complex puzzle that shifts public opinion and makes new ideas feel normal. Those ideas become part of our socialization. The process that teaches the norms, values, and other aspects of culture. We're socialized by institutions like our families, schools, friends, and mass media. And of course, technology is another piece of the puzzle. The internet and social media now help ideas spread faster than ever before. Our beliefs are informed by all social environments. For example, the belief in marriage equality. In 1996, when Gallup first asked about that issue, only 27% of Americans supported it. A 2018 Gallup poll showed that 67% of Americans supported same-sex marriage. That's a huge shift. Through decades of social movements and political actions, marriage equality gained traction, eventually tipping into mainstream acceptance. In 2015, the Supreme Court reflected that belief ruling that the Constitution guarantees a right 
to same-sex marriage. But even then, it wasn't unanimous. It was a five to four vote. And that's how social change happens. It's not like everyone all of a sudden just decides to agree. We have to take a really long view to social change and cultural change. Oftentimes, political change will precede it. You have to think about a relatively small group of people trying to convince the rest of culture, the rest of society and politicians that their way of viewing the world is not abnormal, but completely legitimate. And that's not an easy task. Back to that earlier example, women's suffrage was followed by the women's liberation movement of the 1960s and the 1970s, which led to third wave feminism, which created an environment that now supports new ideas about what gender even means. Here's another way of looking at it. Social change often acts like waves in the ocean. One wave crashes against the shore, and then another rolls in. The waves build on each other. And then one day, everything looks different. Thousands of years ago, the Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, the only thing that is constant is change. Social change is complicated, and it takes a long time. It arises from conflict and people coming together because of that conflict. So what do you want your world to look like? All right, so this is a video that you did see yesterday and I've replayed it because um, a lot of you will haven't actually looked at the recording in terms of um, the video. So what I'm going to do is I am going to play another video that is also linked to lesson 20. I'm going to quickly just share my screen in terms of that and we can go to there. So this is also linked to social change as an emergent force. And it's a video in terms of, it's, it's by The Economist. So I'm going to play it and then we can just, I'm going to continue with the lecture. There's a less familiar story about COVID-19. The crisis is boosting innovation with the emergence of brand new ideas. mRNA vaccine, a new technology. And with the application of existing ones in surprising new ways. The crisis has caused an acceleration in adoption of technologies. This is pushing the world further into the future. We've had to build more airplanes than we ever have before. Often at breakneck speed. We just closed 250 million pounds. Businesses are being forced to adapt. Well, oh, thank you. Amazing. Or face extinction. Another hammer blow to Britain's retail sector. This upsurge in innovation will bring lasting change for good and bad. Could you get into your computer? Yeah. This is my kid's future. So what lessons can be learned? as the world looks towards the post-pandemic era. There is an opportunity for innovation to stay at the cutting edge. I haven't seen this. Is this a new piece? What is this part? The, the, the front of the fuse. Got it. This is the headquarters of Zipline a drone manufacturing company. This is 3D printed? Yeah. Oh, this is plastic now, yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Since the pandemic, the business has really taken off. Drone technology has been around for a while, but during the pandemic, it's starting to realize its considerable potential. With social distancing the new normal, health systems around the world are now looking at drones as a new and better way to deliver products such as blood, cancer treatments, and vaccines. Every hospital system and health system on earth is suddenly trying to reconfigure itself to a new reality, to extend the reach of the hospital system directly into the home, enabling care closer to where patients live so they have to travel less, it's more convenient, and the patient takes less risk of getting infected if they need to access general care. From mid-June, 
to September 2020, Zipline delivered more than 100,000 medical products, as many as over the previous three years. And we've done a few things. The center wing covers are now. When did that change? Ah, weeks ago. Perhaps the most significant change has come in countries with strict airspace laws. In May 2020, an emergency license was issued in America, allowing Zipline to fly long-range delivery drones through controlled airspace for the first time. And in December, American regulators issued new rules, allowing drones to fly over people and at night. This looser approach is accelerating the shift towards more states receiving medical supplies in a more efficient and productive way. So we're seeing hospital systems that previously thought they had 10 years to affect this kind of change, now trying to do this in one year. Although drone-filled skies are some way off, COVID-19 has also accelerated the conversation around the use of drones beyond healthcare in a variety of new fields. So I'll pop this, I'll pop this out. Zipline has partnered with retail giant Walmart it's one of a number of companies due to begin trial deliveries of consumer products. I think it's been really easy for people to understand the value, and there's a pretty intense sense of civic pride around the country leading the way in terms of showing how this new technology can save lives. This kind of rapid adoption of emerging technologies has been called tech acceleration. And it's the type of innovation that has been given the biggest boost around the world by the pandemic. A classic example of tech acceleration was what happened in the National Health Service in England, where a system to make possible video calling was effectively built over a weekend and then rolled out to doctors across the country. Tech acceleration is pushing companies further and faster into the future. Exactly how many years into the future we've been pushed by this crisis varies. It depends on the behavior, it depends on the country, but it does seem to be sort of of the order of five years. So welcome to 2025. History shows that innovation often thrives during times of crisis. Take the financial crash of 2008, which led to the widespread adoption of cloud computing. The cloud had been around since the early 2000s, but it gained a new footing as the economic slowdown took hold. Companies were very often reluctant to try cloud computing. They thought it wasn't secure. And then they gave it a try, found it was cheaper, found it was more secure, and cloud computing has expanded very rapidly. As well as accelerating the adoption of developing technologies, Crises can also foster the development of entirely new ideas. A good example of a crisis that led to lots of invention would be the Second World War. So you get the first digital computers, which are used for code breaking. You get the first jet engines. That paves the way for mass air travel. You get nuclear technology, which is used for weapons, but can also be used to generate energy. And you also get the first rockets. When it comes to new ideas, COVID-19 has left its mark in the field of medicine, where researchers around the world have pioneered new techniques in the development of vaccines. This phenomenal work has been done, multiple teams producing vaccines in months rather than years, uh, using entirely new technologies in some cases. So these mRNA vaccines are a new type of vaccine and they seem to work extremely well. So that's a very impressive example of invention. We are collectively telling cafes, pubs, bars and restaurants to close. In most industries, the pandemic has boosted innovation by forcing companies to adopt new ways of doing things, purely as a matter of survival. We have innovated for necessity. Even for Michelin star restaurant owner David Moore. Lockdown forced him to place 90% of his staff on furlough, an emergency government scheme that pays the wages of workers. For the business, it meant we had no income. I had thought 
that maybe we wouldn't be able to get back to doing what we did before. So to save his business, David adopted something once unthinkable in the rarefied world of fine dining. A takeaway. The restaurant turned this into this. Oh, thank you. Amazing. A heat at home Michelin star ready meal. Now the restaurant's vegan box has proven so popular, it has been rolled out nationwide. I definitely see online as something that is staying with us. It's totally invigorated the business. Billy, that's the sound fair. As businesses throughout the hospitality industry have been forced to adapt, the pandemic has fueled the rapid growth of the meal delivery industry. Globally, the total revenue of this industry is now expected to reach $182 billion by 2024, an increase of more than a third from the projected level in 2020. When the pandemic recedes, the innovative mindset many businesses have been forced to embrace looks set to linger. For David, the unexpected success of his food delivery service points to a hybrid model for the future, one that will allow his chefs to continue to innovate in the kitchen. Home delivery is not going to finish fine dining. Fine dining is here to stay. People want to be looked after. They want the crisp linen. They want the waiters looking after them. And they want no washing up afterwards. But while the pandemic has made innovation a necessity for some companies, it has also restricted opportunities for others. Amidst the huge economic downturn, companies have been consolidating. The third quarter of 2020 was the busiest for mergers and acquisitions in three decades. A trend that is likely to tilt resources for new thinking and new ideas further towards big companies. By and large, big companies can continue to invest in difficult times. They can continue to take market share in a way that small companies can't. And so generally, this is leading to a sort of greater inequality between companies. It's a sort of big gets bigger phenomenon. There are parts of America you can only scout if you come in here. Your international harvester dealer show. History also suggests that successful companies tend to start life more often in the good times than the bad. Of the biggest American firms founded since 1970, more than 80% were born during eras of growth. During economic downturns, life can be much harder for startups which are so often the engines of innovation. But back in the booming world of online food delivery, some startups have found hungry investors. So we just closed um, 250 million pounds. Sorry, <laughs> we just closed 250 million pounds. Sisters Ginny and Eki Newton run Karma Kitchen. It's a startup that offers flexible kitchen space, known as ghost kitchens, to cooks and restaurants catering mainly to the delivery market. While some ghost kitchens are owned by a single restaurant chain, Karma Kitchen has many different companies hot stationing under one roof, producing everything from West African donuts to tandoori curries. The company was founded two years ago, and the pandemic has transformed its fortunes. What would have taken us potentially three years to achieve has now taken eight months in terms of market demand. The startup has recently opened its second ghost kitchen in London, and it has another five sites under construction. It plans to build many more ghost kitchens in residential and office hotspots across Europe. We want to open 60 kitchen facilities. Um, that starts for us with the funding. The ambition of fast growing startups like Karma Kitchen can attract investors, but it can also end with a startup selling itself to a larger company with deeper pockets. And that brings its own risks. We see from research on mergers and acquisitions 
when uh, an acquisition happens, the innovativeness of that small firm typically goes down. The question really is whether large conglomerates will be able to fuel these startups in order for them to carry the front in terms of innovation and for that innovation to then be disseminated into the rest of the organization. For many large and small companies, working from home has been the most significant innovation to come out of the pandemic. If you're putting your energy in focusing on your flaws, they will grow. In 2020, COVID-19 turned a little known tech firm into one of the success stories of the pandemic. At the start of the year, about 10 million people were taking part in meetings over Zoom each day. But this had shot up to 300 million by April 2020. And the widespread adoption of remote working during the pandemic could lead to further innovation in future. More companies may be inclined to take risks and embrace new ideas in the coming years. They've discovered that actually working from home can work really well. It doesn't seem to make people less productive. They make people more productive. That will mean that after the crisis, companies will be more willing to keep some of those behaviours, maybe have less business travel, maybe have more working from home, and maybe even dare to try other things that they were reluctant to. So it's just allowing them to be tested and not punishing people if they don't work, because that's just going to put them off. Some of the most groundbreaking ideas require the right opportunity and circumstances to demonstrate their value. Two decades ago, e-learning emerged as a radical new idea, predicted to transform the world of education. But such predictions fell flat. Sending all students home for the rest of this semester after a coronavirus outbreak on campus until COVID-19 struck and the potential of remote learning became clear. Last week, one of the questions that I had for you is, what do you think it means to be healthy? The online education market is set to nearly quadruple between 2019 and 2026. The pandemic has really changed the culture inside educational institutions and made them more open to, to adopting e-learning. Online learning uh, democratizes learning to a great extent. Uh, it's, it has allowed students to really customize learning to, to their needs. You could complete an entire degree online because you may be in a part of the world where it's very difficult for you to commute to, to a university. The culture change around online learning seems here to stay. But with it comes a reminder that new innovations can also struggle to overcome some old challenges. For full-time university student and mum of three, Christina Holly, studying before the pandemic was going well. Every semester I got um, A's and B's I was meeting and beating my own expectation. And my kids were studying really hard and grades were good. But now, Christina is unable to afford the technology required to allow her family to participate in the switch to e-learning. Having the transition to online education was terrible. There weren't enough devices in the home. I want to try and restart the internet first. Using one Chromebook for three children is terrible. First of all, their schedules were at the same time. So when you have all three of you have to start school at 8.30 on one Chromebook, it's impossible. According to America's Education Department, nearly one in eight children do not have internet access via a desktop or laptop at home. Digital learning looks likely to entrench social inequality in the post-pandemic world. The reliance on technology has really surfaced these inequalities that existed before, but that were not as present because everyone was in a room together. Christina says that falling behind could force her to become a part-time student 
and that this will reduce her financial aid and affect her ability to pay for her college studies. I hate to even think about what that means because this is my, my life. You know, this is my kid's future. There is really no other option for me other than school. This is what I need to do in order to bring us out of poverty. Many of the innovations that have flourished during the crisis are centered around digital technology and will have become part of everyday life when the world returns to more ordinary times. Technologists and policymakers face the challenge of ensuring these new innovations do not entrench inequality, but instead broaden opportunity. I think that this is really an important chance for humanity to not only bring new technology to bear, but for the first time bring it to bear in a way that is equitable for humans on Earth. Okay, so very interesting video. Um, and what I was doing is I just took some notes as, so we would have had a discussion in class around the videos that you actually have seen. So the very first one in terms of women and how they have progressed and relating to social change, how that has impacted women and how gradual the change has been. It has taken decades for there to be shifts and changes. And more specifically, the lady mentions the issue of voting and how this was something that was not heard before. So women were perceived as the, um, the ones that uh, the home bearers, they took care of the home, they took care of children, they actually managed the home while men went out and they had careers and they worked. And now, the, the landscape, the social landscape is changing. Women are focusing more on their careers, on their education, and they also want to get ahead in their career. So when you look at society today, there is a lot of households where there are two people who are contributing. Um, if you look at a husband and wife or two partners that are sharing a household, and they both go out, they work, they study, they progress in their career. So women are now becoming, you know, they, they, they're moving ahead in their careers. They're developing themselves, gaining knowledge to actually grow their careers. And they want an even playing field. I think if you look in terms of where women sit in, and in South Africa, that is a challenge, but social change is happening. It is happening incrementally. So when you look at, for example, in terms of um, the King Report, and it's something that I might have mentioned, I'm not sure if it was this lecture, the one yesterday, or in another lecture that I mentioned. So the King Report in South Africa is, is quite important because if, if a company is listed on the Johannesburg Stack, Stock Exchange, one of the things they have to do is they have to adhere to the guidelines of the King Report. And that is, um, if they do not adhere to the guidelines, they are then fined and they have to pay a hefty penalty um, in terms of not adhering to it. So some of the things that are covered in the King Report are issues such as the environment, it's gender diversity, gender inclusion, um, you know, women on board level. So you'll see if you look at a number of organizations and if you look at their in annual report or integrated report, they do a reporting in terms of the changes on the board um, uh, level and in terms of their structure. And also they report in terms of the split between male and female colleagues um, who sit on the board. So a lot of companies you will see there is now sort of an equal uh, split, 50-50, or some is slightly more, or some, some is slightly less. In terms of the overall workforce of an organization, there are generally, the women are less. However, those dynamics are changing when it comes to the social aspect of it. And there is traction being made. From where women have progressed, 
to now. And I think it's a point that I've also raised before and mentioned that when I had a look at the stats and it may have changed um, now that only 5% of women are CEOs on listed companies in South Africa. So it's interesting to see in terms of social change, when it happens, how it happens. Now, when we take a look at the video, the COVID-19 video, what comes out very strongly is the aspect of innovation, right? When things go wrong, like when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we had to innovate. Whether you were working, you were a student, life in general, running a household, whatever it was, you had to innovate and change your life completely. Each one of us had to do that. The one thing that that video really comes out strongly and, and, and um, mentioned is that change is in, inevitable and we live and work in an ever-changing environment. So there is no constant in the environment that we all exist in. Now, COVID-19 gave a lot of companies a competitive edge. A lot of companies who could not um, actually compete in that space for business, they shut their doors. Um, if you look at um, in terms of technology and how it was fast tracked, so if you look at, for example, the um, if you look at the industrial revolutions and where we are now, COVID-19 literally fast tracked those innovations in terms of drone technology. So in many instances, especially in the, the communities where access to healthcare is difficult, meaning people have to travel long distances to get to a clinic just to get their repeat medication or chronic medication. Drone technology was at the forefront where it helped people to get access to medication. And as opposed to being able to travel and put their lives at risk, what they then did is they had their medications delivered via drones and it was a safe option for them. So that drone technology became fast track. It is part of the industrial revolutions. However, you know, when COVID-19 hit, and especially in the healthcare sector, that actually fast-tracked and it was brought, brought to the forefront. And that then uh, came to that point is that technology and the evolution of, of technology and the role that it plays in our lives. So we had a new reality. We had to face a new reality with COVID-19. And, you know, in terms of the way hospitals did um, operated. It was different. There was different technologies. So COVID-19 has gone beyond healthcare, right? It's not just in the healthcare space. And one of the things they spoke about in that video is tech acceleration. So it's ex the acceleration of technology to another level. Now, if you do not understand the industrial revolutions, so we, we have progressed from the first industrial revolution right up to the fourth and fifth industrial revolution where we are now. So it's the second industrial revolution, third. And so what, what I would suggest to you in terms of your research, go through and look at the different industrial revolutions and how they have evolved over time. So Fourth and fifth industrial revolution speaks to artificial intelligence. It looks at things like drone technology. That is between the fourth and fifth industrial revolution. So very important is to go and have a look at those, um, do some research on it for your own understanding. Because when you speak about these factors is to be able to identify actually what are we talking about when we say fourth industrial revolution and in terms of how technology has changed. So there had to be, in terms of social change, a change in behavior, a change in attitudes, embracing technology, embracing the way the world was changing through COVID-19. So there was a reluctancy, right, in terms of change. Remember, change is never easy. When you undergo change, it is something that is difficult to actually embrace and actually to, 
to go through with, it is extremely difficult. So the example that was covered in the video was the cloud computing. So in 2008, if, I, if I've captured it correctly, the financial crisis that hit the, um, the markets, right? The financial markets, even though cloud computing existed in the 2000, in the 20th century, what had happened is it was fast track when the financial crisis hit and cloud computing was brought to the forefront, right? Crisis also can foster an acceleration in an innovation. So where there is a crisis, there is opportunities for innovation to take place because people need to think out of the box. They need to think differently. They have to change their mindsets. In the instance of, of the gentleman, his name is David, where he had a fine dining restaurant and you know the patrons were not able to frequent that establishment because of the lockdown that was implemented by the government saying that you cannot go into a restaurant, restaurants cannot operate, they cannot sell alcohol, and, and, and. So, I mean, it was the, the similar scenario in South Africa. We couldn't go to restaurants, we couldn't go to the movies, we couldn't go to any establishment. We had to be confined to our homes and there were restrictions on the times that we had to be out and about. So it was very restrictive. And David thought about it and he, he was concerned because what is going to happen to his restaurant? Now, what about employees? This impacts then in terms of the unemployment rate. So he came up with something very innovative called the takeaway ready meals. And um, you know that actually, that opportunity, the ability to innovate changed his entire business dynamic into a booming business. So much so that he, you know, even a vegan box was becoming a popular um, uh, item that customers actually wanted and they ordered and, and, and they would, it was delivered to their door. So in terms of the accessibility and the innovation, if you look at Uber Eats, right you you simply use an app and you have food delivered to your door like so many other fast food chain restaurants if you can think of so a number of of, of fast food um restaurants didn't close down because they literally what they did is they would de deliver you would order some of them you could just call and you would place your order and it would be delivered to your door and it would be safe you didn't have to leave your home you didn't have to go into an establishment because you couldn't actually do so because it was closed. It, it was not, op they were not allowed to operate. So in terms of being innovated, other companies like Checker 6060, who actually implemented the delivery service called 6060 before COVID-19, that actually was, the timing could not have been more perfect for them because during COVID-19, they were able to sort of innovate and move on to e-commerce channels and then order their groceries online and have it delivered to their door. So that is, I'm just going to quickly switch over to um, the hotspot on my phone because the electricity is going to cut off and I don't want for us to be disconnected. I just want to do this very quickly. You might have a glitch on your side. It may glitch and it will connect. So for example, um now for a brief second or two you actually um you were not able to connect with me but now i'm back online so literally what had happened is that i was able to be flexible enough to know that i'm going to be recording and at two o'clock when we have load shedding 
this is going to disconnect. The wi home Wi-Fi is going to disconnect and I'm not going to be able to continue with my recording. So before the load shedding actually kicked in, I then went and connected my hotspot um, to my laptop in order to continue presenting. So even when the load shedding kicks in, we I will still be recording on this video. So the companies like Checker 6060, um, Woolworths, Pick and Pay, Spa, all of them had different options. If you look at the boom of the e-commerce industry, companies like Take A Lot and Amazon and eBay, all of those companies already had e-commerce platforms in place. So what they did is they looked at what the gaps were and then they capitalized on that, meaning that they went out there and they added more products. So Take A Lot actually reinvented in a way in the sense they added more product offerings to their basket of products. And you could then almost use it as a one-stop shop, which was innovation on their part. And a lot of people were using, in fact, using those platforms. So a lot of companies also were finding it more and more difficult to actually cope with the economic instability that was brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, there were mergers and acquisitions happening. So bigger companies that had the financial um, sort of resources and capability were able to merge and acquire smaller businesses that could then continue under the, the, the banner of the, the parent company and to remain sustainable and viable. The only risk with doing mergers and acquisitions is where a larger company actually purchases a smaller company is the fact that innovation may fall away. And it's something that they did mention in the video is that innovation may fall away. There was another um, instance where the ladies, the two ladies who started up the ghost kitchen. And when COVID-19 hit, it actually their business took off to another level. And the lady did mention in the video that what would have taken them three or maybe four or could be even five years to get to instantaneously, it was an overnight success in terms of reaching their goals and objectives in the sense that there were a lot of companies, smaller companies um, who were in the food business that could not pay those operational costs. So what they literally did is they went and rented what we call a ghost kitchen from the entrepreneurs and their overheads were then reduced substantially, which meant that they could continue being operational and being profitable. In terms of how we connected and what happened when COVID-19 pandemic um, hit South Africa, the way we worked, the way we studied, the way we lived completely changed. So you saw the stats that were provided around Zoom because everything, people started working remotely, right? Just for safety reasons. And what had happened is meetings were being held over Zoom, over MS Teams. MS Teams has now become part of our life even post-COVID. Zoom has remained part of our life even post-COVID. And MS Teams is now one of the most popular um, platforms used for engaging for teams, such as today we're doing, uh, I'm recording this lecture, which then can be shared on YouTube via my channel. Um, how has technology just evolved so that we can continue functioning in a society and there's the social change that's happening around us. So in October, 2020 and August, 2021, and it would have been very similar with you when you were doing your PR2 and your PR1 when COVID-19 hit, your classes would have been online and not face-to-face. -face. Now it's being phased in but it's called a hybrid model where some classes are held face-to-face, -face, 
Some classes are held over MS Teams and some classes are pre-recorded like the one that I'm doing. And then you would play back and listen to the video um, when you have the time. So it is very interesting when you look at um, the example in terms of the pros and cons. Sometimes it does work in our favor. So academic institutions that um, had to evolve and those that were not prepared in terms of adopting the virtual um, learning platforms had to do so at the, at, at the speed of lightning because the academic um, industry or, or sector is very competitive. So if you are unable to study at one institution, you are going to try at another institution that's going to be able to accommodate you, even if it's virtually. The sad reality in the flip side of social change, not all of it is positive. So during COVID-19, the lady with three children, um, it was really sad. I mean, she was, she was studying and, you know, it was face to face and then COVID hit and she was like getting A's and B's and all of that. And then COVID hit and with the three children having to be schooled at home through virtual platforms and also herself being able to connect virtually to attend her lectures, etc., And with the lack of internet um, capabilities or access to that resource and a laptop, it was chaos and very difficult for her. And that might force her into going back to part-time studies. So when we look at social change and in terms of the impact that it has in our lives, it is undeniable that we have to be flexible, we have to be agile in terms of the ever-changing environment. Okay, so now strategy, okay, we're gonna talk about, sorry, not strategy, social change as an emergent force. Strategy within the context of organizations is usually associated with the positioning or repositioning of an organization towards a realization of a future state Strategy identifies a future state for the organization to pursue and the decision required to achieve that desired state. There are a range of issues that affect organization. Changes to the internal and external influences is one of them. So COVID-19 in this regard is an issue that affected organizations internally and externally. We did cover this yesterday, so I'm just going to read through it very quickly and then move on. So developing shared visions and goals and setting a new direction for the future of the organization is one of the most powerful ways of effecting change within the organization or responding to external forces of change. Shared visions and goals set new directions for the future. So if you look in the case of the two entrepreneurs, who had the ghost kitchens, right? They had a shared vision and goals for the future. And they had sort of a three to five year plan in terms of the ghost kitchens and expanding. However, when COVID-19 hit, they looked at an opportunity that was available and they had to set new directions for the future because the future in essence became the present and they had to become agile and take hold of this opportunity and maximize it, which they did. And it, 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 the results were astounding. Drive and personal commitment by leaders is the motivating key, is a key to motivating a group into action. So remember with anything in terms of your leadership, your management team, if you're wanting to actually implement a public relations strategy or a campaign or come up with an emergent strategy, whatever the case may be, you need that buy-in and support from your leadership team and management in order for this to be a seamless process and not to have um, almost a tug of war where you are trying to implement something and management say, no, we can't do this. And you know for a fact that it is going to bring about positivity in terms of the workplace, 
So those are some things that you have to grapple with as a public relations practitioner and work around. You're going to find challenges in the work environment, which you then have to think creatively. And we mentioned this yesterday, is think out of the box to be, to be able to come up with creative solutions, right? Organizations and business strategies are subjected to the influences of social change. So the example that we used in terms of companies who are listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, they've got to actually, it's not mandatory, but they have to follow the guidelines of the King Report. If they do not, then they get um, fined a penalty, which they need to fork out money for that. And that would mean there's, if you haven't had a chance, please go through and read, even if it's a summarized or a summary of what the King Report says. It's a very important document in terms of governance in South Africa today. And it is something that um, companies who are listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange have to be vigilant and they have to align. That is all part of social change, right? So understanding the source of social change. Social change is a transformation of the social order in the community by adjustments being made to social institutions, behavior, and relations. It involves social evolution where society makes changes to traditional societal norms leading to the necessary change. An evolutionary process to change manifests in altering the social mechanisms relating to cultural configurations, behavioral conforma conformations and expectations. Social change leads to increased awareness and more understanding. To understand the concept of social change, the source of change must be first appreciated. So I have browsed through that. I haven't gone into depth because we covered that in our lecture yesterday. Now, there was an article that I asked um, that you read as part of the learning. It's the impact of public policy on farmers in India. And that was on page 65. And it illustrates the impact of social change on society. So I'm going to read it to you and make this a little bit easier for you as well. So impact of public policy on farmers in India. In 2007 in India, the Union Minister of Environment, Forest and Climate announced that bamboo was being reclassified from a tree to a grass thereby effectively removing the requirement of felling slash transit permits for its commercial usage. Prior to this declaration, an impediment for bamboo agriculture by farmers on land deemed non-forest existed. This reclassification resulted in the improved provision of raw materials to rural communities in India who use bamboo in the various industries, including crafts, furniture, paper-based products, and home construction, thereby stimulating economic activity in rural area. And if you look in the textbook on page 65, you will see that there is an in-text reference as to where this information was sourced from. So looking at this little um, mini case study, in terms of the reclassification right, of bamboo from tree to grass had a number of ramifications because it, it, it hinged on change of legislation where it was, and, and that is exactly, if you, if you see, there wasn't a glitch in the change when the power went out. So the power has gone off now and you haven't really experienced a glitch on the screen. So I tried to plan that, and that speaks to the ability to be agile in any environment or in any situation where we need to conform with change, okay? So that hindered on legislation, and then it made, it, it had an impact on economy because then it opened up the economy 
And in terms of the rural communities of India, they were supported in terms of being able to conduct business. So that is how important it is in terms of social change when you look at the impact that it has overall. Right, so now some sources for change are accidental or unplanned, which means that COVID-19, we go back to that, it's unplanned. It's an unplanned uh, pandemic that we never expected. And when it arrived, we had to just scramble and we had to look for ways of changing our lives to be able to live. We had to start wearing face masks, which some of us dreaded. I mean, I for one dreaded it, but I did it because it was a responsible thing to do. Because if I was COVID-19 positive, I did not want the virus to be, I didn't want to be the reason why someone else caught COVID-19 and possibly died from it or were hospitalized. Um, so that is something that's unplanned. Accidental is, for example, I'm trying to think at the, at the top of my head, it's like it, when you meet an accident. It, you didn't plan when you woke up that morning to actually meet an accident, right? It just happened. So it's something that is accidental and it has, you know, these effects that require change to happen. The development of unpredictable situational factors defies several assumptions of how change happens and therefore it often takes quite a while to understand. So with COVID-19 and the reason why we use COVID-19 because it is an example of something that it, on a global scale not just locally on a global scale, it impacted and it shook the world and it terrified all of us. So it took people time. So when we say unpredictable situational behavior, right? And sometimes it takes quite a while to understand. So how often did you see someone not wearing a mask? There were times where I was, where we were permitted during certain times to go to the store where I went to the store and I jumped off my vehicle and only to realize when I had taken a few steps that I didn't have my face mask on and bolt back to the car to put my face mask on up until it became um, almost a practice, even the sanitizing and hand washing. So walking into a store is you would sanitize your hands. Back then they would have someone at the door um, spraying the sanitizer on your hands and then they had trolleys so stores had to also change and it took them time but they had to do it at this at a, you know quite a substantial speed in, in order to comply with the legislation so even the trolleys that were there available or the baskets the hand baskets we had the little um, what do you call them those little cloths I can't even like almost similar to your wet wipes that you could use a sanitizer and sanitize the handles of the trolley or the basket that you were using and then when you got back in your car i would the first thing i would do was sanitize my hands so it takes a while for us to get used to it it took a while for us to understand that wherever we went we had to apply social distancing of a certain 1.2 meters and things like that. It took a while for us to get used to it. It took a while for us to understand, you know, when someone, there were two income households, when someone in that household got retrenched, it was something that they had to work around. Change begins from circumstances and events that occur simultaneously in many areas if the change remains disconnected, nothing happens beyond each incident, and we have spoken to that yesterday. When they become connected, actions that are unique to the changing situational context can emerge as a powerful system with influence at a more global and comprehensive level. We also covered that yesterday in, in, in the recording, so if you can, please refer to that if, if you haven't done so but you should have by now already 
listen to the recordings because if we would have had class online, we would have covered it yesterday. The strategist will therefore be responsible for repositioning the organization to successfully manage changes emanating from either emergent or deliberate factors. Now, there was also an exercise on page 66 that I will read that you were also meant to look at and interrogate. So responding to COVID-19, a situational context. The spread, now before I go ahead, is this is very important to back to my earlier point that I mentioned at the beginning of the recording and to the point that I made yesterday also on the recording is that it is important for you to read the chapter, to read the roadmap, to have a look at the information, to also, so in your textbooks, when you have case studies, it is a given that even if it's not in covered in the slides or the roadmap, that you, the onus is on you to actually go through and read the case studies and to be able to interrogate them, understand them, and to see what exactly is it that is being covered in that particular case study. So that is the reason why I say read the roadmap on your Thursday or Friday, whenever you get the road, whenever the roadmap is uploaded on Core Campus and go through and read the material that we will be covering for next week. So reminder, week five is next week. Please go to through the roadmap before class on Tuesday and ensure that you have read the chapter. If you are not understanding what is covered in the chapter, read it again and again. And then if there is something pertinent that you don't understand, Raise it in class so that we can go through it and you can get a better understanding. So the case study on responding to COVID-19, a situational context, the spread of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent global crisis has forced governments, educational institutions and organizations to reconsider and revise the way transactions are conducted for organizations to be relevant in this new paradigm of uncertainty and change, organizations are endearing to further digitalize their operations, become data-driven, enhance e-business potential, reconfigure their organizational structures to reflect agility and restructure costs into greater variability. For instance, several universities such as Harvard, Princeton, the University of Cape Town and other South African universities announced a migration to online learning. From a business perspective, e-commerce trade shows and conferences have become the new world order. Evidence of this new normal of business interactivity is illustrated by the confederation of the Indian Indian Embassy holding the digital conference and exhibition on India-Japan business partnership in the New World Order that took place on the 17th of March 2021. So that was in the midst of COVID-19. This platform allowed a wide range of sectors in business to establish digital booths to enhance trade between the two countries. Now, if you look the source, it was compiled by the author. That is the in-text reference and the author of the textbook actually compiled this, compiled it, and obviously in consultation with the other authors, discussed this. So what I'm going to do for now is I am going to pause this recording or I'm going to stop this recording because if it's too big, it actually, um, you have a challenge, it, it takes a while to download. So I'm going to stop sh sharing my screen and I'm going to stop recording. I'm going to then get this uploaded and the links will be shared by Coke Campus and WhatsApp. Uh, and this is for tomorrow's lectures, uh, the two lectures that we have tomorrow. So I will chat to you shortly. Thank you guys. <laughs>